Does anyone know what this is a picture of? So these are, right, this is a picture, again, we've got a scholar in the back. Um, and a lot of people who knew this up front, I, I'm, I'm uh, curious and interested that you know it because I knew nothing of uh, Indian boarding school. So as the displacement was happening, uh, white Europeans were now United States citizens, who are white men, were trying to figure out what to do with the Indian problem. And a lot of people, you know, you've maybe heard of the smallpox blanket, the idea of somehow spreading disease and killing these people, but oh, what are we going to do about the Indians? And I think Richard Carlyle, who founded this Indian boarding school, probably felt like he was doing a good thing because his feeling was, no, 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 we can kill the Indian in order to save the man. If we get these children in and we teach them how to be more white and civilized, then maybe that's the root. So I think he thought what he was doing was a good thing. Now, imagine yourself as a child, or if you have children, imagine your children or grandchildren being taken from their families, taken hundreds of miles away, put into a boarding school where, upon arrival, the hair was cut, clothes were taken off, these little Anglo outfits were given to them. They were there to learn English and to, and to embrace Christianity. These children were told that if you speak a syllable in your own language, you will be punished. It meant having your mouth washed out with lye or snipped to your tongue. Now, I don't know about you, but if I were a little kid and I'd taken away from my family and I saw somebody I knew, anybody I knew, I think I'd want to say, what's going on? Think about what it means to say you can't talk until you know our language and our rules. And so I go back again to I now know that the indigenous people that my family displaced when they said yes to a land grant, that's all you have to do to perpetuate racism, is to say yes to a policy that you haven't really thought about who may be getting the raw deal on it. I think about the indigenous people that my family displaced, which I now know it's the Maliseet Nation, and I think about how my family talked about how sad it was that they drank so much, the kids weren't doing well in school, well, holy cow, how would any human being be doing when their entire society had been systematically wiped out and then shoved away on reservation? I don't have answers as much as I have um, explanations for now what I'm seeing. It makes perfect sense to me that there is so much suffering and so much struggle on reservation and for Native people who are trying to navigate a white world and told that they cannot use their own laws to process uh, when a white man comes and commits a rape on a reservation. It's, it's the white judicial system that must process that crime. It's not able to be processed according to, to uh, Native custom. I can't imagine how I would even function if that's what had happened to my people. So here I like to pause because a lot of time in our culture we don't stop and feel. So I'm just going to ask people to stop for a minute and think about what you are feeling. And if you could say one word. Usually I bring the microphone around, but I'm just going to have to. It's interesting to see the range of feeling that has come up in a room. In a society where we're not taught to feel, because that's kind of girlish, that's kind of weak. And sadness. Shame. Shame. Disgust. Empathy. Empathy. Helplessness. Grief. Grief. Anger. Anger. Embarrassed, disgust. I'm thankful that we're finally talking about that.
thankful, we're finally talking about it. Compassion. Discouraged. So what gets interesting around my yeah. and thought is in a society anyone ever taught not to talk about what is anything like to say, don't say anything at all. Okay, now we're really going to talk about the violence and trauma that racism has caused our country. We have to feel, and we, and we have to profit, and we're not all going to be in the same, on the same page at any given time. There always has to be enough room in the room for everybody's thoughts and feelings. So sometimes someone who says disgusted will say, well, what? how can you say thankful? This is disgusting. And thankful will say, yeah, but disgusting, stop feeling disgusted. At least we should be thankful. It's much harder to build a connectedness around multiple ideas, <coughs> multiple thoughts, multiple feelings at once. And yet, that's the way human beings are. That's what diversity is. So even in all white communities, where people say, there's nothing we can do, we're all white. I say, yes, you can. You can start changing the culture right now. You can start talking. You can have courageous conversations. You can remember that it's okay to feel. Okay, so are we ready to move on? Anybody else's heart pounding a little bit? My heart always pounds a little bit right here. Okay, so I talked a lot about how, how powerful media images were for me in conveying information and words. Think about how different it is today. You know, when I was a kid, we had three ways to get your, well, three news channels. Everyone tuned in from 6 to 6.30, ABC, NBC, CBS, all staffed by highly trained journalists. We were sort of, you know, on the more on the same page. Yeah, they were white, and yet that was a way that people got their news. Think of how different it is today. I'm sure I'm missing all kinds of icons. I made this slideshow last summer. I'm sure there's new ones that should be up there. So I want you to turn and talk to someone near you, and make sure there's nobody left out as you turn. Make sure everyone is included. If you have to have a uh, group of three, that's fine. Here's the question I want you to explore together. The way we get our information has changed vastly. Are we better off or are we worse off for it? I'm going to give you three minutes to discuss that. Anybody, but maybe could we hear from like three people? And um, how are we going to do this? Because usually I would hand you the microphone. Uh, you could come up here. So it's going to take three brave souls who are willing to share. <laughs> when I try to keep my uh, my actual social thoughts to myself. <laughs> but part of our discussion was it's so hard to tell. There's a lot of information out there, but probably most people, now that's just the way we we were seeing it anyhow, but most people filter what they pay attention to. And that, you know, they figure out what they're going to watch, read, when, because they're finding something to reinforce their point of view, what they already, you know, what's in their knowledge circle. And it's, it's hard. We couldn't decide for sure if we were better off. There's a lot more, there are more uh, sources of information than there were before when it was Huntley Brinkley, uh, yeah. Walter, Walter Cronkite, and Roger Mutt. See, I was born in 48. Mm -hmm. 
and in 1960 I was living in North Carolina. And I'll, okay, and I'll say this just as an in 19, no, in 2011, I became aware that there was a big celebration for the 50th anniversary of the settlement of the lawsuit in Chapel Hill. And a friend of mine from in, you know, became a friend in junior high and high school won his case to be allowed to attend my junior high and high school. Black. So there's a lot of collective history in this room. A lot of collective wisdom. Do we have a third person who wants to share what you talked about? Okay. And while you're like... I'm just going to shout it from here, though. I've got some bad footage. I'm concerned about people who might have can, hearing issues in the room, though. Can everyone hear me? No. No. Yeah? No? No. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I want to say the idea about people um, choosing what they want to see. And someone else pointed out to me recently that there's also an algorithm on our, our uh, internet system that's filtering for you too. So if you go look at funny kitty videos, you're going to start being fed funny kitty videos. Um, our group talked, I mean, we didn't actually come up with an answer either. We don't know if we're better or worse off. But the one thing that did come out is the, um, uh, the role of the citizen journalists now. That we get more information from just the everyday person because our mainstream media tends to filter out some things that we may not be, you know, for whatever reason we don't want to see. Um, but then also, we are getting more information through other international sources that in the past we really didn't have access to. Um, we get information from places in China where they really kind of kind of keep a hold of the information. They don't allow a lot of information to come out. But because of this kind of free internet network, we can get information from all different sources. And in some ways, that's a benefit, too, because otherwise we would never know about what was happening in certain parts of the world uh, because our mainstream media doesn't pay any attention to those parts of the world. Right. Right. Okay, so, th so thanks for all of that. And, you know, really, we're back to good and bad. Was it, are things better or worse? Usually, it's a both and, a both and. In some ways we're better, in some ways we're worse. What does this mean about being a good person? Well, is it possible to be both good and clueless? Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, what, another part of our culture in the United States is, is very much about black and white thinking. Either or, good, bad, heaven, hell. There's not a lot in between. And so another way that we can work in our communities to grow more um, agile in being able to navigate conversations around racial and um, other violent <coughs> histories and experiences is, is to be able to not think in black and white terms, is to be able to allow thoughts and feelings and all these complexities to enter the space and then not to freak out when that happens. Which I say that um, speaking about myself. I'm a kind of a control freak, I have OCD. And I really like everything to be all lining up. So this has been a particularly hard journey for me to learn how to embrace uh, the complexity that's just part of life. Okay, so we're right back. You know, this is the whole feeding our belief system, what we already, what we want to hear, what we think we know. I will tell you that I force myself to follow uh, uh, the algorithm must be so confused by me because I, I am very diverse in who I listen to. And, and what material, what media I digest. Okay, Albert Einstein, by the way, major white anti-racist. Who knew that? I only knew him as a scientist. He says we can't solve problems by using the same kind of thinking we used when we created them. So one of the things I talk a lot about is the, is the dominant American culture, meaning not that white Italian culture not that Jamaican culture, not that Korean culture. The dominant American culture that we all need to live by once we step into public spaces. The one that says if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. Conflict, avoidance, black and white thinking. So all of those are 
values and ways of being with one another as defined by the dominant white culture, which I also call the white culture. I'm, probably, I'm not the only one who does that. In some spaces, I can't even say white culture because it freaks white people out. But I heard a lot of people say in unison, white, earlier, so I'll go in there. So let's look at some um, unhelpful white ways. This is a short list. Feeling entitled and equipped to help, fix, and take charge. This is a white way that is so embedded in me, I'm kind of doing it now, right? My whole book is feeling entitled to help. I still see this showing up in me, though I'm learning to manage this impulse. Because when it comes to racism, it's a white person. There's a guy with a garden hose trying to put out that incredible inferno. I had no idea what I was dealing with. I still only somewhat know what I'm dealing with. I have to deal, I have to work in community if I want to be a part of solving a community issue. I can't feel entitled to go start after school programs by myself. Number two, assuming that formal education trumps lived experience. This shows up for me in terms of hearing someone's grammar. If I hear incorrect grammar, I will immediately start to discredit the message because I think, ah, oh, they're not as educated. It's unbelievable what goes down in my mind. And I encourage you, and my book I think does a pretty good job of pushing, my book for those of you who haven't read it, it's written as a memoir, but at the end of every chapter is a question if you want to take yourself on a similar journey into your own subconscious and your own belief system. Okay, number three is reacting to discomfort by getting defensive, judging, or disengaging. Did anybody grow up with a mother who pulled out the silent treatment? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if the easiest thing in the world for me to do, if I don't like what my husband is saying, is to just... <laughs> and choose how long I'm going to give them the cold shoulder. Uh, defensiveness. I didn't mean it that way. I, I didn't, no, 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 no. You totally misunderstood. I didn't mean it that way. Really, how you meant it is secondary to the impact what you said or did had on somebody. And judging, well, the opposite of judgment is curiosity. And yet, I judge all the time in ways that keep me from asking questions that might help me get at more um, accurate information. So these are some helpful white ways that help to maintain the status quo and for me trapped me in a state of ignorance. There I was marching around trying to help the world because I was this high class person with a good education so I must know how things worked. And then if anyone tried to suggest that what I was doing was out of bounds or there was